by myself, uh, Suzanne and Eileen. So I am going to kick it off first to Eileen Fielding of Audubon, Connecticut, um, who's going to first give us the answer to who is on that first slide and then take it away. Eileen, okay. you're up. Thank you, Sharon. Let's take a look again at that bird. And it is in fact a wood thrush. And I think some of you caught on that it looks rather like a juvenile wood thrush. So for those of you who got the ID correct, congratulations. And we'll just move on into the webinar. First, a little background. The Healthy Forests Initiative is part of National Audubon's Working Lands Conservation Strategy. That's one of Audubon's five major strategic priorities. And it's because Audubon recognizes that bird habitat is not just in protected preserves, it's also in privately owned land. And that includes land that's managed for food or for forest products. So working lands have a potentially important role to play in bird conservation. So the working land strategy involves working directly with private landowners, land managers, industry, and with government agencies that work with landowners and on land management. And since some public lands are also working lands, in New York and Connecticut, we work with state and federal agencies to improve habitat on those public lands where management is allowed. So Audubon is organized by flyways. In the Atlantic Flyway, which is shown here in green, the Healthy Forests Initiative predominates and it includes forest protection, good forest management, and advocacy for good policies at the local, state, and federal levels. So taking another look at this map, in the Atlantic Flyway, forest is the predominant natural vegetation. The forests are vital to the birds who breed in the forest, winter in the forest, or pass through on migration. And just to make sure you know, the blocks shown here in green are just part of the forested land in the flyway. These are the areas mapped here that Audubon has identified as high priority breeding habitat. We should also mention here that while today we're focusing on the work of Audubon in Connecticut and New York, the Healthy Forest Initiative is really a team effort by National Audubon staff throughout the states in the Atlantic Flyway. So the combined effort is important because a majority of breeding birds in the eastern forest are declining and about a third of them are in significant decline. So enhancing their breeding success through forest management is one part of an overall effort to help them recover. So priority birds. In New York and Connecticut, Audubon has identified about 50 species that we're calling priority birds. The list shown here is just a sampling, there are more. And some of them are chosen as priority birds because their numbers are sharply declining, as we'll see in a moment. Others have priority because their presence is associated with a habitat type that should be maintained and protected, and they're indicators of that habitat. And as we are going to see in the next few slides, each of these species has its own habitat requirements, and that can inform our management choices for forests. For example, this black-throated blue warbler does best in large tracts of hardwoods or mixed woods, having dense cover for nesting within five feet of the ground. Now here are examples of more priority birds. These have experienced significant population decline since 1970. The Canada warbler on the left has numbers who have dropped 63%. It prefers moist, mossy, mixed woods. It likes downed trees, dense plant cover near the ground with young conifers. The wood thrush on the right is also in steep decline. The wood thrush needs leaf litter for foraging. It needs mid-story shrubs for nesting. It prefers to be under tall canopy trees. Now these two are examples of birds who need early successional forest habitat, young forest, which is becoming increasingly scarce. American woodcock actually need a combination of conditions, wet woods, open ground, and young forest. The golden wing warbler nests in shrubby young forests with a few scattered tall trees. Cerulean warblers have declined steeply across their range. They usually nest in the mature interior forest canopy 
up in the treetops, often near small sunny gaps in a canopy. And then in contrast, the prairie warblers prefer to nest near the ground in young forest. So while the causes of population decline are not exactly the same for every species, a common factor for all is the loss of quality habitat, whether on the breeding grounds, along the migratory routes, or on the wintering grounds, although we're focusing on the breeding grounds right now. So what degrades forest habitat? The quality of forest habitat can be degraded in many ways. Fragmentation into small parcels means more edge and less interior, exposing some of the interior species to hazards they're not well equipped to handle, such as nest predators that may frequent the edges. Invasive vegetation, mostly non-native plants, but even a few native ones, displaces plants that are the best food sources for birds, whether that be fruit or seeds, or the insects that are adapted to live on the native plants. Overabundant deer can browse away the plant cover that birds nest in and prevent the regrowth of young trees. And in that case, the forest may have little or no structure at the ground level or mid-levels. Additional stressors include outbreaks of pests, such as gypsy moth, emerald ash borer, or fungal diseases. And of course, a major stressor is climate change. The topic of climate change is covered in more detail in a different webinar, but we'll mention here that climate change stresses forests through extreme storms, unseasonable weather, and extreme variations in temperature and precipitation. All of these things can lead to changes in forest bird habitat. And the predicted effects of climate change on bird habitat can be seen with Audubon's online birds and climate visualizer shown here. You could go online and enter a zip code or a state and see the vulnerability of your local birds to climate change. You can look at two scenarios. We'll take the wood thrush as an example. Here's how the vulnerability assessment works. In this map, a 1.5 degree increase in summer temperature eliminates some of the wood thrush's breeding habitat. You can see that in red at the bottom of the map. And it adds some in green at the top of the map. But overall, the range map is fairly stable and the thrush has low vulnerability to the 1.5 degree centigrade change. But if there's a three degree rise in summer temperature, you can see by the large patch of red that that would lead to an extensive loss of habitat. The more range loss we see, the more difficult it will be for a species to cope with climate change. So in the face of all these threats, what can we do to maintain and improve forest habitat for birds? We know that forest diversity is important, whether across a whole forested landscape or within a particular stand. So let's look at what we mean by diversity. This graphic right here shows how successional stages from young forest to mature forest provide habitats for different bird species enhancing bird diversity through forest age diversity. For example, the golden winged warbler, second from the left, nests in young forest. The wood thrush, second from the right, nests in mature forest. But it's not really that simple. Even a single species may use different stages of forest throughout its breeding cycle. And we can use these two birds as an example of patch trading. If you take a look at the golden winged warbler, the golden wings may move into older forest after they nest, seeking food and cover. The wood thrushes nest in the mature forest, but later on, they benefit from using patches of younger growth where their fledglings can forage and hide. Now, this is not to say that every single forested property needs every age of forest. The landscape context is an important factor. The surrounding forested land considered as a whole, may provide the age diversity that meets the needs of young forest obligate species, plus the post-fledging and migratory stopover needs that serve a wide variety of birds. So a typical bird habitat assessment looks at the 2,500 acres, give or take, surrounding the parcel that's being assessed. Doing that, we may discover enough young forest nearby, somewhere between five and 10% of the total, that would benefit a full suite of forest birds. 
that helps inform management decisions on a particular property. And now, Suzanne will talk about important features to look for within a stand that provide diversity. Great, thanks Eileen. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I am going to quickly switch over to um, my screen here and share that. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so after we assess the surrounding landscape and estimate forest age class diversity, we then zoom into the stand level. And while we can look at landscape with satellite imagery, mapping programs, and property ownership maps, for stand level assessments, we really need to be on the ground. The habitat features I'm about to discuss can be created or improved through management, and you'll see I have some numeric goals included in some features that help guide us through our assessments. Hey, Suzanne, it's Sharon. Oh. Just going to interrupt real fast to gotcha. say that you are not in presentation mode. <laughs> I see. I see. So sorry about that. Am I now? You are not. So maybe Eileen mm -hmm. can just take back over while you talk through. Sure. Oh, I think it. There think you it, go. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I hit slideshow a couple times. Um, so. Thank you for your patience with that change over there. Um, so one big takeaway is that these habitat features create complex structure. And one thing that we often tell forest landowners that we work with is the messier, the better as far as habitat is concerned. Okay, so the first habitat characteristic we assess is vertical structural diversity, um, which is the layering of vegetation at multiple heights in a stand. Stands with high vertical structural diversity have overstory, midstory, and understory vegetation layers that have a combination of trees, shrubs, uh, herbaceous plants, and vines. Vertical structural diversity is important because it provides different birds with places to nest, perch, forage, seek cover, and raise young. And vertical structural diversity can be enhanced in mature forest uh, by creating canopy gaps. Uh, this will stimulate the growth of understory vegetation by allowing more sunlight to reach the forest floor. In large diameter hardwood trees, which include things like maples and oaks, of at least 24 inches diameter at breast height, and we have it abbreviated here as DBH, diameter at breast height, and softwood trees that include pines and hemlocks of at least 20 inches DBH. Those offer nest sites, perches, and places to forage for a number of forest birds, including some of our bigger forest birds, um, like red-shouldered hawks and broadwing hawks. And large trees with cavities and large dead branches enhance the habitat for many forest birds. And I'm going to talk about cavity trees in a minute, but if you can leave a large diameter cavity tree, um, that certainly is a big bonus. Um, so our management recommendation here is to, where you can, where it's possible, retain a component of large diameter trees, and if you don't have any, select some smaller trees to leave and become large diameter wildlife trees in the future. Okay, so conifers, which include, again, things like hemlocks and pines and spruces, those provide birds with cover habitat and places to nest and forage. Softwood inclusions are specifically sought out by some forest birds for breeding habitat, um, birds like blue-headed vireos and black-throated green warblers. Our management recommendation is to retain or promote at least some softwoods where they occur, and especially, uh, this, it's especially important within um, predominantly hardwood stands. Um, and even a small cluster of softwoods has high habitat value to forest birds. Dead standing trees or snags provide locations for nesting and roosting and foraging for insects and cavity trees of all sizes provide nesting and roosting sites for birds. Uh, both snags and cavity trees are heavily used by other wildlife too, so they're, they're, they're high habitat value for all wildlife. Different sizes of snags and cavity trees, um, so living or dead, is desirable, uh, but a general rule of thumb is the larger the better, with at least one big 18 inch diameter at breast height, DBH, hardwood snag per acre. And where you can do so safely, try to retain at least six snags or cavity trees per acre of varying sizes and stages of decay. Um, and if you don't have snags or you don't have enough or as many as you'd like to enhance wildlife habitat, you can easily create them by girdling trees. 
Downwoody material, um, this includes both coarse and fine woody material. It enhances habitat for forest birds by providing places to seek cover, perch, nest, and forage. Uh, larger down logs, so something that's a pretty big diameter, greater than 18 inches diameter at breast height, those provide especially important habitat structure for birds and other wildlife that forage or nest on or near the forest floor. Um, and larger logs are used for drumming displays by roofed grouse. And an added benefit in areas where deer densities are excessively high, leaving slash may prevent deer browse and benefit forest regeneration because it provides an obstacle that prevents deer from reaching regenerating seedlings and saplings. Um, our management recommendation is to protect existing downwoody material during harvest operations, and you can increase it by leaving poor quality logs and other cull material, treetops, or slash. Um, again, kind of similar to snags, providing coarse woody material of different sizes and stages of decay is ideal. Um, and I just want to point out really quick, the picture on the right there um, looks like it could be a great site for a Canada warbler to build a nest, um, although it could use a little bit more conifer cover in the understory. Um, and then I want to tell another quick story really quickly, and I think, I think this person is actually... Um, attending the webinar right now, Bev. Hey, Bev, if you're on, hello. Um, so Bev told me last year that um, she had some cutting done in the winter and I had done a site visit with her the, the summer before, but she had some trees cut um, and uh, the logger left behind a lot of slash material in limbs after the cut. Um, and she had an oven bird nest within some of the slash that was left behind that following spring. So it's a great example of how important um, having a uh, complex structure on the forest floor is to birds and how immediately they can begin to use some of these important habitat features. Leaf litter contains abundant invertebrates, a very important source of food for birds like wood thrushes and should be left in place. Leaf litter also protects soil moisture and enriches the soil. Um, our management recommendation here is to protect leaf litter by planning any forest management that requires heavy equipment or machinery until the ground is frozen. Native vegetation provides the most habitat value to wildlife when compared to non-native plants in managing forests to provide a diversity of native trees, shrubs, vines, and herbaceous plants increases the suitable habitat potential for forest birds. Um, it is important to note, though, that there are some native species, such as American beech and hay-scented fern, that can dominate a stand and reduce overall diversity. Um, native plants are important because they support, support all or part of the life cycles of our native insects, which are the primary food source for the majority of forest bird species during the breeding season. And in addition, native trees and shrubs produce more nutri nutritious mass, which includes things like fruits and seeds and nuts when compared to non-natives. So our recommendation is to manage for a diversity of native forest plants to ensure that birds have available food resources, including insects and mass throughout the year. And just really quick, I wanted to show this table. Um, if you're interested in learning more about which birds use different special habitat features we just went over, um, we do have a table, and this is a snippet of a table here shown. Um, we have this available in our educational materials uh, from New York that we published over the past couple years, and I'll share more about those in a few slides. Um, but I just want to point out that this table does include information about preferred nesting habitat and post-fledging habitat. So again, getting at what are the um, preferred forest habitat for the full breeding cycle. Um, and then we also include in that last column there special habitat features and an overall habitat description for, for a number of birds that you'd find in New York and Connecticut. Okay, so now we're going to shift into the healthy forest work that Audubon New York and Connecticut is involved with. And as you'll see here, our work is a combination of outreach, education and training, technical assistance and habitat management guidance, as well as advocating for policies that not only keep our forests as forests, but also support forest management that improves bird habitat. Okay, to start with forest owners, um, they're the primary owner of the majority of forest in New York and Connecticut, um, making them an important audience and conservation partner. 
We reach out to forest landowners with targeted communications, and we also offer educational workshops and woods walks to let them know what they can do to protect and better manage forest habitat. When we work with forest owners, we really strive to emphasize that our management recommendations are compatible with many other goals a forest owner may have for their land, including timber management and hunting. And depending on the project, uh, we can also provide a site visit to forest owners where we perform a habitat assessment and discuss possible management options. We then follow up with a written report that includes the habitat assessment. So I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about what we include in our habitat assessments and how we go about them. Uh, so the written habitat assessment we provide to forest owners includes a landscape scale overview as well as the forest age class diversity in the surrounding landscape, um, as well as the stand level habitat assessments, such as the presence of multiple canopies, invasive species presence, and tree and shrub species diversity. Uh, we also provide management recommendations to improve habitat for birds and other wildlife based on the assessment. Depending on the landscape context and stand level conditions, we may propose um, even age forest management, which includes shelter wood, seed tree, and patch cuts of varying sizes, um, or uneven age management, or a combination of both. And uneven age management includes things like thinning and small group selection. Uh, the, sh the photos here um, show examples of what we might be included in our management recommendations. So the top photo shows the result of a group selection cut where several trees were felled to open the canopy and allow light to promote understory regeneration um, and really build up that nice understory layer that is so important to forest birds, but had been missing previously from this forest. The bottom photo shows soft edge, um, which is the gradual transition along a mature forest edge from short to taller vegetation. Um, it's, and it's a technique that can really help reduce edge effects, which again um, is predation and nest parasitism by brown-headed cowbirds, um, and create better habitat for birds that might avoid a hard edge. Uh, but there are a lot of other options we may give um, and our recommendations take into account the landowner's goals for their property. We then help guide the landowner to next steps, um, such as connecting them with a forester if they're uh, currently not working with one, um, or we also help them with state or federal agencies that provide financial assistance for land management. And to date in New York and Connecticut, we have provided several hundred habitat assessments to forest owners. Yeah, and just one more uh, observation here. It is possible that the recommendation after habitat assessment is uh, to take no action or uh, employ no management measures. And that would be the case if the habitat is already excellent. So uh, management does not always mean uh, this, these kinds of active interventions. We do find that to be unusual, um, but just wanted to be clear that sometimes that does happen too. Okay, thanks Eileen. Okay, so I want to go over uh, a few projects that we're currently involved with in New York. Um, we are working um, on several projects with multiple partners, and you'll see that some of these are multi-state projects that uh, we've partnered with Audubon Vermont and Audubon Pennsylvania on. Um, but all of these are focused on working directly with forest owners to create better habitat for birds. Harvest for Habitat, which is based in the Upper Delaware Watershed and Woods, Wildlife, and Warblers, based in Northeastern New York within the Lake Champlain and Upper Hudson Watersheds, focuses on working directly with forest owners, providing education and technical assistance to guide on-the-ground habitat projects. The Central Appalachia Habitat Stewardship Program in the Allegheny Highlands um, also connects with forest owners by identifying forest bird conservation centers which are large landscapes comprised of public and private land and multiple conservation partners, whose aim is to improve forest health and habitat through forest management. And just from these three projects alone, we estimate that we're gonna bring more than 15,000 acres of forest under improved management for forest birds. And now a word about Connecticut. Uh, in Connecticut, we're working with landowners and land trusts on three projects currently. In the Lyme Forest Block, which is near the mouth of the Connecticut River, we have a very active outreach program. It engages land trusts and individual landowners in several towns, offering workshops and walks and trainings about bird-friendly management of forested properties. 
So far, and we're still going strong, but so far over 300 landowners have participated and they have actively influenced the management of over 500 acres. Uh, some of them have done pretty substantial uh, projects on their, own, on their own land. And there's more to come on that project. Um, in the Southern New England Heritage Ford Forest Corridor that runs through Eastern and Northeastern Connecticut, we're working with foresters and landowners in partnership uh, with many organizations and with the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And we're providing bird-friendly management plans for landowners on up to 6,400 acres by 2023. And across the state, we are working with land trusts and another grant funded program with the US Forest Service to develop bird habitat management guides for up to 3,000 acres of protected land trust land. Okay, so another important audience that we work with are foresters. Um, and given the scale of our work, foresters and other land managers are essential partners that can help us reach more forest owners and improve more habitat. So we work directly with foresters offering educational and training opportunities so they can integrate bird-friendly forest management into the forest management plans they develop for forest owners that are interested in managing their land for birds. And to date, we have provided programming and training for more than 100 professional foresters in Connecticut and New York um, that manage, manage hundreds of thousands of acres of forest. Um, and we have more planned uh, for foresters that we are gonna share in a few slides. So Audubon New York and Audubon Connecticut have also developed written guides for both landowners and foresters, and these supplement our outreach and training programs. And pictured here are the New York guides, which you can find on our website. The uh, links are posted right there. Uh, these guides include much of what is being presented today with the forester's guide providing much more technical management guidance. And Connecticut's guides are getting ready to be printed, so stay tuned for those. Thank you. Audubon Sanctuary Lands in New York and Connecticut serve as demonstration sites for tours and workshops where we can show landowners and foresters what management for birds looks like. We have forest habitat demonstration sites at both the Sharon Audubon Center and Sanctuary in Connecticut, pictured on the left, and in the Rhinestrom Hill Audubon Center and Sanctuary in New York, pictured on the right. We also have additional forest habitat demonstration sites that we've created through various partnerships in the St. Lawrence Valley, New York, that showcases golden wing warbler habitat. And we are also a partner in the Young Forest Demonstration Project in Speculator, New York. Yeah, uh, we'd just like to mention here, uh, we find that it's helpful to give people a look at a demonstration site because as Suzanne was mentioning earlier, forest management can look really messy at first. But if you can, show people at a demonstration site what that same spot looks like after a year or two years or three years and they can see how rich it is in the new growth, the new understory and just the burst of bird life. It helps people understand the benefit much better. Okay, another key component of the Healthy Forest Initiative is public policy that supports protecting key forested areas and improving forest health, resiliency, and habitat. One example of a recent policy win in New York is Regenerate New York, which is a new New York State Department of Environmental Conservation cost share program, and it's going to help forest owners address forest health and regeneration issues, such as excluding deer to allow for regeneration, controlling invasive plants, and uh, implementing good forest stewardship to improve forest health and resiliency. So these photos show the difference between a forest overbrowsed by deer and with nothing but Japanese barberry, a non-native invasive plant, in this understory. Um, and that's shown in the photo on the left, um, as well as the regeneration that can happen when deer are fenced out and invasive plants are controlled, as shown uh, in the photo on the right. And these are actually photos from our Rhinestrom Hill Audubon Center and Sanctuary demonstration site. Yeah, and those are uh, initiatives that apply to forest management directly um, to protect them from deer. Um, there are initiatives in Connecticut. One in particular that I want to mention is that Audubon is represented on the Governor's Council on Climate Change as it relates specifically to the role of forest management and watershed protection. 
And uh, actually, we're going to be talking a little bit more about that on the next slide. So uh, we'll just go ahead to that. And sure. So we wanted to touch on some of the new work that we're, we've already started uh, developing. Uh, but going forward, we are expanding Forrester training from uh, kind of our single workshop um, model that we've been using to a multi-step process uh, that will also provide them with follow-up educational opportunities. And what's exciting about this is we're even exploring the possibility of endorsing those foresters who engage in intensive training with Audubon. Um, so that we, we may eventually have a list of foresters who've undergone our training. Um, so if there are landowners who are interested in manage, managing their forest for birds, um, they can check out our list of foresters and know that they're working with someone who, um, who works closely with us and has undergone uh, training from Audubon. Um, we're also planning to adapt Audubon Vermont's Bird Friendly Maple Program, which has been very successful, um, and we hope to expand that to maple syrup producers in Connecticut and New York. We've started a very small pilot program. Uh, it's currently underway in New York. Um, and then supporting emerging policies for carbon sequestration and carbon storage in forested land can be a win-win. Climate change adaptation and mitigation through forest growth is generally compatible with bird-friendly forestry. As we adapt to climate change, we can help forest birds adapt too. So we've been utilizing tools and resources and connecting with staff from the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science to incorporate climate adaptation strategies into our forest habitat management work. Well, okay. That brings us to the end of the formal presentation. So we'll wrap up with this thought. Uh, making our forests healthy for birds serves many other purposes as well, uh, as we can see from what's gone before here. We aim to bring together people and places and policies to make bird-friendly forests happen. And uh, as a final note, just before Q&A, uh, Suzanne wants to share something about where to find the science behind all our management policies. So take it away, Suzanne. Sure, just really quickly, if anyone's interested in um, the science that we base a lot of our um, habitat needs for forest birds and, the, and how they respond to forest management, um, if you look to our, um, our guides that we produce for landowners and for foresters, um, they include a full literature review. Um, and so there's a, a million citations included there that if you're interested, you can always check those out um, to dig into some of the, the great scientific literature that's out there. Well, great. We do have a couple questions in the chat, not too many. Um, so now's your chance. If you have questions for our panelists, you should please write them into the chat box. We'll do our best to answer them in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, we will, again, this, this webinar is being recorded, so we will follow up with a link to the recording, and we can also uh, include links to the guides, the landowner guides that were mentioned in the presentation in the follow-up. Happy to offer as many resources as we can. Um, so Suzanne and Eileen, uh, you can see our panelists, uh, sorry, not our panelists, our attendees writing into the chat box, but, um, but there have been a couple questions about um, how can private landowners get in touch with us to get a habitat assessment or recommendation. Uh, so if maybe Eileen, you could first talk about how you're working with landowners on an individual basis in Connecticut and then Suzanne, you can take it over for New York. Okay. A lot, of, a lot of our capacity to work individually with landowners depends on what grant funding we currently have. So uh, sometimes we can work with landowners in a particular geographic area or uh, landowners who fall into a particular category. Right now in Connecticut, our focus is on working with landowners in the Southern New England Heritage Forest Corridor, which is a long way of saying Eastern Connecticut. Um, that's where we are funded to work one-on-one -on -one with landowners. Um, they would need to contact an organization called The Last Green Valley, which is administering the project. It's a regional conservation partner project. 
and uh, there are multiple partners involved. And uh, if anybody wants to contact me directly or uh, reach me through the um, email that's on the screen here, I'd be happy to give you more details about that. If you're not in Eastern Connecticut, but you're interested in a forest habitat assessment, happy to talk to you anyway. Uh, we don't have a grant funded program uh, handy right now that would, um, that would make it uh, a one-step process, but we do want to hear from interested landowners uh, and that may help us shape um, a, an, uh, an upcoming proposal for a grant so that we may be able to work with you. So don't, don't hesitate to reach out and we'll have a conversation. Okay, and this is Suzanne. So for New York forest owners, if you're interested in a habitat assessment and a site visit, um, we have a similar prioritization process that Eileen just described um, based on grant funding. So if you are located um, in a current project area, and if, it, you know, I, I did describe the watersheds, but obviously that's kind of hard to picture in your head if you're located in a watershed, um, you can always um, send an email to us and we can let you know where those locations are where we have active projects. So that would be the upper Hudson and Lake Champlain watersheds um, in northeastern New York, uh, the upper Delaware watershed and the Catskill regions, and then the Allegheny Highlands in western New York. Um, but we do have a bit of flexibility to also prioritize landowners located in our priority forest areas. And I know we showed kind of a, a larger um, eastern U.S. map indicating those. Um, but again, you can just send us an email and we can follow up with you to let you know if we can, if we can get out and um, provide that technical assistance to you. I should add uh, also in Connecticut, uh, in the lower Connecticut River in what we call the Lime Forest Block, um, there, there's also uh, grant funding to work with individual landowners. So that's another option. And a few people just asked as a follow-up if we have um, any limits to how to how big or small acreage-wise a property should be in order to um, do a habitat assessment. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so again, we do try to prioritize landowners based on the acres they have. So sometimes when we're doing outreach, we will have a, um, a minimum acreage target. Um, sometimes that's 50 acres, depending on the area. Um, but at the same time, we, we want to stress that even small landowners are really important and they're part of larger forested landscapes that are very important to forest birds. Um, you know, it, it might be um, a bit of a stretch for us to get out to someone who maybe owns like 10 lake acres or less. Um, but if you're in one of our project areas um, and you know, you're, you're a little bit under 50 acres, I think that we would still um, be able to accommodate you. Um, it, it really kind of depends on the situation. Um, but you know, we have really limited staff um, to be able to dedicate um, a lot of time to traveling all over New York um, for some properties, but um, it's always worth reaching out and we can, we can always try to talk you through the process. Yeah, it, it is a bit context dependent as well. Uh, if a parcel is 10 acres, but it's uh, in a context of a, of a much larger forest, it might make sense to take a look at what measures can be done in a small parcel. And here in Connecticut, um, I've encountered groups of landowners who are collectively working on forest management plans for their, uh, their total area. And there are ways to do that. And uh, we really love to see that. So that's another way that owners of small parcels of land might be able to participate in some of these programs. Thank you very much. I just wanna shout out that we have a 10 year old watching who's asking some very good questions. One of which is um, which are the trees or shrubs that each of you thinks is a super, super beneficial one to add to a property. And, and sort of along those lines, we're getting a number of various questions. Uh, what's the best thing to put in my yard? What's the best thing to put along the edge of a forest? Um, so maybe you could give us 
your favorite native plant, but then sort of speak to um, how you how you select the plants depending on the place where they're going. Sure, that's a great question. And it's very exciting to hear that um, there's a 10 year old attending this. That's fantastic. Um, so uh, we typically, and I say typically because there's always exceptions, but a lot of time when we do management, um, we allow for natural regeneration. Um, but that doesn't mean that we may not uh, give some recommendations if someone's interested in um, kind of jump starting the regeneration process or if they have a, a piece of land that may, um, may have some regeneration issues and they need to plant do some supplemental planting. Um, and we actually have, Audubon has a great resource to find native plants local to you. And I do believe that includes tree and shrub species as well. So if you're working in an area where you're trying to um, plant within a, a forested system, um, you should still be able to find things that um, will grow well where you're from, some natives. Um, some things that I know are really beneficial for birds um, in northern hardwood systems that we, we have a lot of in New York include oaks and maples and hickories, um, anything that produces mast. So think of cherries too uh, with soft mass um, and shrubs. The list is never ending. There's so many fantastic native shrubs um, that, of course, um, you know, I don't even know where to begin with that. Blueberry <laughs> and service berry and uh, any dogwood, native dogwood. Um, and uh, there's a family that I can't even think of the name of right now. It escapes me. Um, viburnums. Yes, that's it. Thank you to someone sitting in the room with me here <laughs> to remind me of that. Um, any viburnum like arrowwood. Uh, it, um, winterberry holly is another great uh, native shrub. There's so many, and so many of them are beautiful too. So you can kind of get um, the aesthetic value as well as the habitat value out of them. Um, and, uh, you know, also try to think of that species diversity and get some conifers going too, like some white pine. Um, you know, just be careful to write about, uh, to read about the uh, planting guides for certain species. I know some people get really excited about uh, firs or spruces, but you want to make sure that you've got a site that can accommodate those. Um, so yeah, so uh, the, the site that Audubon has is Plants for Birds. Um, and you can go and you can enter your zip code and it'll kind of give you this uh, list, this menu of options to choose from. And I think they might also connect you with local nurseries that might be able to supply those. Although I will put in a plug for the New York State DEC nursery based out of Saratoga. I think they're still running their, um, their tree and shrub sale where you can actually go on and you can see what they still have available. They have a fantastic list of native trees and shrubs. They even have packets that you can um, purchase for um, like ruffed grouse and other birds. Um, they indicate plants and trees that are um, really important to birds and uh, pollinators as well. So it could be a good place if you're, if you're shopping around for some native trees and shrubs to, to check out their site. <laughs> well, I, I want to echo just about everything Suzanne just said. Um, in Connecticut, uh, if you're looking for sources of uh, native plants, we could certainly help you out if you contacted one of our centers. And I do highly recommend uh, going to the Plants for Birds website. Uh, one of the things that's fun about it is that you can uh, choose by bird that you wish to attract. You can choose by the soil type you have, whether you're in sun or whether you're in shade. Um, so it can really help you put together a suite of plants uh, to put in a yard. So you don't have to have 10 acres of forest. This can be in your yard that will uh, do a great deal to support birds throughout the year uh, if you choose the, the native plants judiciously. Um, so go for it. And just so everyone is totally clear, that is the Audubon Native Plants Database. It is available at audubon.org slash plants for birds. That's all one word, plants for birds. And then uh, the spring seedling sale that Suzanne mentioned in New York is through the DEC. Um, so you can just Google DEC spring seedling sale or spring plant sale and it'll pop right up. Um, but audubon.org slash plants for birds is the main website that you can visit. Um, 
As far as the trainings go, we're getting a few questions about who can attend what type of training. So, you know, if a training says it's a forester training, can, can non-foresters attend? Who, who's the ideal audience for the various types of trainings that, that we do? Yeah, for the for the forester training, we we do we really do want to limit that to professional foresters. Um, we may also include some additional land managers um, if they um, are doing if their their profession involves um, active forest management. Um, but we we are really trying to focus the forester trainings just to foresters. Um, but we do have uh, programming that we tend to offer, especially in the spring and summer and the fall, um, for forest owners. Um, we will have two spring workshops coming up, actually one in late spring and one in early summer. Um, so there, uh, I don't have the dates nailed down just yet, but in the Catskills, we are going to have a forest owner workshop um, again, we do try to limit that to forest owners. We do direct mailing to invite them, um, but we also do some other promotion to, um, to try to re reach them as well. Uh, but we'll have one in late May in the Catskill region, so stay tuned for that. And then we're also going to have a woods walk um, at the Kunjamuk Young Forest uh, Habitat demonstration site that I mentioned in Speculator, New York at the end of June. Um, and we're going to be coordinating that woods walk with the um, Adirondack, the Southern Adirondack NIFOA chapter. That's the New York Forest Owners Association. So we do we do offer programming for um, for forest owners. Um, sometimes we also invite the general public as well if we have some space and some room. Um, and I know we are planning with the Southern Adirondack Audubon chapter, uh, we're gonna be doing a bird-friendly maple walk in July. Um, so stay tuned for details on that as well. So we have, we've got some, some fun programs coming up um, that we do invite a broader audience to. <laughs> uh, Suzanne, I can tell you have a much bigger state than Connecticut. <laughs> got a lot of locations to cover. 18.9 um, million acres of forest. Yeah, right. um, but uh, just to give you some uh, pointers about opportunities in Connecticut, we do uh, some forester trainings that are just for foresters, but we also do landowner workshops. Again, in our case, the dates are not all nailed down for the coming season, but we will be doing landowner workshops uh, in Sharon, Connecticut, up in the northwest corner. Um, as I mentioned, in the Lime Forest block, uh, down near the mouth of the uh, Connecticut River, there will be workshops. I, uh, I know of one in June, and, and there will be more. And we're in the process of uh, uh, talking to the Goodwin Conservation Center up in eastern Connecticut. So in partnership with Connecticut DEP and the Connecticut Forest and Park Association, we may be offering something up there. So uh, just keep in touch, keep an eye on our websites. Uh, these things uh, should be uh, broadcast as soon as we have dates. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think it's, that that actually speaks a little bit to what I was going to say next, which is that it would it seems like it would be helpful to clarify for our attendees um, the sort of scope of Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York um, and where we're working currently, where we have centers and um, and staff. So Eileen, obviously you're at the Sharon Audubon Center in uh, Sharon, Connecticut. Um, can you just speak a little bit to where else we're working in Connecticut? And then Suzanne, the, the same for New York, just so people have a better sense of who they can contact if they live near a center, for instance, or um, you know where they can visit us in person and then where you're actually located. Sure, in Connecticut, we have uh, three staffed centers, um, Sharon Audubon Center, which also includes Miles Sanctuary in Sharon, Connecticut, that's the Northwest corner. Uh, also in Western Connecticut, about an hour south of us in Southbury is the Bent of the River Audubon Sanctuary. And uh, we have a demonstration forest here at Sharon Audubon. At Bent of the River, they have a very interesting ongoing uh, project maintaining an early successional forest or a shrubland. And uh, that might be interesting for people to visit. And then down in Greenwich in the Southwest 
part of the state, we have the Greenwich Audubon Center. We also have the center at Stratford Point where uh, we do coastal work and uh, not to uh, miss out on our statewide programs, which are uh, staffed from one of the three centers, but which are offered across the state. And that's, uh, that's where you might encounter uh, one of our Audubon programs, uh, say at the Goodwin Conservation Center uh, in conjunction with the Connecticut Forest and Park Association or in partnership with, uh, with some other center at another location. Um, did I miss anything, Sharon? Was there something else I was uh, supposed to mention there? No, I think that's great. Okay, sorry. Okay, yeah, in New York, we have, um, so I'm actually based in Ithaca, New York, at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is a fanta fantastic place to work if you're in bird conservation, um, and definitely stop by and say hi forever in the area. Um, and beyond that, we have our state office in Troy, New York, where we have staff there. Um, and then we do have several centers in New York. We have our Montezuma Audubon Center, which is in Savannah, New York, I believe, um, technically. Um, we also have our Constitution um, Marsh Audubon Center in um, Putnam County, right on the Hudson River across from West Point. Um, we have our Theodore Roosevelt, Roosevelt Audubon Center and Sanctuary in Oyster Bay, New York, and Long Island. And then we also have some of our coastal staff based in Long Island as well. So we're all kind of spread out. Um, and definitely with our forest work though, it's kind of nice. I get to travel around quite a bit um, and see everybody as much as I can. Yeah, and uh, we also do have sanctuary lands in addition to our staffed centers. Uh, for example, the Sharon Audubon Center uh, ha manages uh, three other sanctuary lands in addition to the Sharon Audubon Center. So if you're just looking for a place to visit and encounter nature and maybe walk a path or a trail, um, there are some other properties as well. Well, I think we covered most of the questions. Um, at the very least, we tried to reply to people directly in the chat box. Uh, if your question did not get answered, that is why we have this little contact, bu contact us box up on the screen with our email addresses. So you can email audubonny at audubon.org and ct at audubon.org with any leftover questions and we will do our best to get back to you in a timely manner. Uh, again, a reminder that I will be emailing everyone who signed up for the webinar with the link to the recording and to some of the resources that we've discussed today. And please do reach out if you have any questions. Thanks to Suzanne and Eileen once again, and thanks to everyone who joined us here today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.